Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, to think how you died for me. I tremble, tremble. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, to think how you conquered me. I tremble, tremble. Sometimes. Well, good morning all and welcome to Hillside Church. We're glad you could join us for worship on this first Sunday in Easter. This morning's greeting comes from the Elder John. In his second letter, he writes, To the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be forever, grace mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Let us pray. It is the third day since your Son was crucified, and like the Christians who lived through those days of darkness, we have our doubts. But as the sun rose today, your Son also rose, giving us a clear sign of his victory over the death and the over the death and the devil. And because of that victory, we no longer have to suffocate or wither in the darkness. We can be heirs and share in Jesus' victory, not conditional on our works, but because you promised it to us, a rock-solid promise we know we can trust. Now that our Lenten journey is over, let us reflect that light and joy of that promise to each other and to those yet to know and find comfort in it. So, rejoice, the stone is rolled away, grave clothes neatly folded, no more the smell of death, behold the empty tomb, hallelujah, he is risen. Rejoice, scripture has been fulfilled, the sting of death is gone, the victory has been won, behold the risen Christ, hallelujah, 
he is risen. Rejoice, the curtains torn in two, our God invites us in. Christ's sacrifice enough to wash away our sins. Hallelujah, he is risen. Amen. This Sunday's psalm is Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Here ends the psalm. Let us rise and let us sing 367, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Good morning. The uh, scripture reading this morning for Easter Sunday is found in Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. In Jesus' name. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accused. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will live long and enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, and they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox with the ox. And dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. So says the Lord. So ends the reading.
morning. Happy Easter. There's an old tradition in the church where the officiant says he is risen and the congregation replies on Easter, he's risen indeed. So we will try that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Very good. Well, uh, I want to dismiss kids for sprouts. Uh, so if they can go to the back doors if uh, they would like and they can be sent to their service. And as we begin, I want to remind us that on Palm Sunday, Luke set out to tell the story of Jesus' passion by putting us into motion. Remember that? We talked about how he gave us that motion on Palm Sunday. And the question was, did we see him? Did we really see him and understand who the man riding in on the donkey was? And today, that motion, which seemed to stop on Good Friday, if you were following the story, now with Luke becomes an explosion. Luke gives us not just motion this morning, but dynamite, and he shakes the very foundations of everything. How does he do that in his telling of the resurrection? Well, by letting us feel what the followers of Jesus felt, Luke's account of the resurrection is very much focused on how people felt that morning. In fact, uh, we hear that Luke is one who really tries to get us into the mindset of all the main characters that show up this morning. There's also something interesting about Luke's account. Jesus is absent. He does not appear in the Easter reading in Luke's gospel. He comes in later. It's his absence that creates the drama and the context to allow for Luke to talk about the people's feelings. In fact, Luke talks about all sorts of things like as you'll hear, he criticizes the women for looking for Jesus in the wrong place, as if they should have known better. And he criticizes the men because they say that the women's story is an, quote, idle tale. We are told this morning explicit details of what the characters felt, what their thoughts were in some cases, and how they behaved because of these emotions. And one set of similar emotions certainly comes into focus this morning, something all of the characters seem to share at one point or another in the story. Confusion, shock, and a lot of doubt. Let's read the uh, account, Luke 24, 1 to 12. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Jonah and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, 
and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. End of reading. Notice the use of adjectives this morning by Luke to describe the emotions of the characters. Perplexed, frightened, they did not believe them, it was an idle tale, marveling. We'll talk about that last word. It's not as positive as you might think. I think we have this view that if we could only see a miracle or know for a fact that a prophecy had been fulfilled, maybe see a healing or something you know, spectacular, it would then be easy to believe. But I want you to appreciate this morning what Luke has done for us. Only the women in the story believed this morning. Everyone else, including Peter, as we'll see, doubts. His little marveling at the end isn't a sign of faith. Only the women believe, and they do so only after the angels chastise them for coming to the tomb at all to look for Jesus, telling them they're in the wrong place, and only after the two men, the angels, remind them to remember the things that Jesus said. Why is it that the women in the story have faith, but the men don't? And why is that important for Luke? What makes the women believe and the men doubt? Why do the 11, of course Judas is gone at this point, call the women's story an idle tale, and then Luke is even more explicit, and they did not believe it. So we think that Easter morning, in its historical context, was like this amazing moment where everyone finally said, it happened, it's Yes, it's done. And everyone just believed, but that's not the case. All of the gospel stories report the confusion that happens on Easter morning. And it's the post-Easter stories, the stories that come after Easter, where people start to believe. Only these women seem to be the ones who truly have faith on Easter morning. None of the other characters do. I think this is deliberate on Luke's part to report this contrast between the men and the women. What is it about the women that allows them to believe and the men can't? Well, it's in what the angels do and say. They said that they should remember, though that is the women, what Jesus had said to them. The antidote to doubt for Luke is remembrance. Remembrance fights doubt but more specifically a certain kind of remembrance, which we'll talk about. It's the word of God that brings faith, not the miracles. The miracles aren't enough. They can always be doubted later. It's the preached word that brings faith. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writing much later will say in Romans 10, 14 to 17. And how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear unless someone preaches? And how are they to preach unless someone is sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I want you to pay attention to that last part that Paul talks about. What's the antidote to doubt? Faith. How do we get faith? By hearing. What do we hear? The word of Christ. The women believe not because they see the empty tomb. As I'll show you in a minute, Peter sees it too and does not yet believe. The women believe because they remember the words that were preached to them by Jesus, the words of Christ. And then the empty tomb becomes an evidence to support that. But it's not the cause of faith. It's the remembrance, the preaching, that is the cause of faith and the antidote to their doubt. The men do not believe because they do not take the time to stop and remember the words of Jesus. In fact, in a later chapter, which appears right after this story, which would be read in the next few weeks, Jesus does appear 
And this is what he says, quote, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. This is not the Doubting Thomas account. This is another account on the road. So he offers physical evidence. And listen to what it says. He says, he showed them his hands and his feet, quote, And while they still disbelieved, and while they still disbelieved, for they were marveling. There's the same Greek word that's used to talk about Peter this morning. For while they still disbelieved, for they were marveling, he said to them, you have any fish to eat? It's not working. Now skip a bit down to verse 44, and then it says this. These are my words, Jesus speaking, that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and they believed. It's when they remember and hear the story from Jesus, that's when they believe. Not when they see the empty tomb, not when they see the hand marks and the nail marks of him standing in front of him. It explicitly says they still didn't believe. In most English translations, the word that... uh, is describing Peter at the end of this account as he went away marveling. And in English, that's a very positive word. It makes it sound like he believes. But we know from just later on in the accounts I just read, he doesn't yet believe. And this is the same Greek word used later, thumazo, which can also be translated as amazed or surprised, as well as marveling. It's not a sign of his faith at this point. Of course, he will get faith. Instead, it's a sign of his Amazement, his confusion, his surprise. He didn't expect this. He didn't see it coming. But he's not quite yet at the point of belief. And this is very deliberate for Luke. You need the word to get you to believe. Physical evidence won't cut it. And that you see again in the Doubting Thomas story later. It's all about blessed are those who have not seen and believe. This is an affirmation of Jesus' words on that. So what Luke has done this morning for us in his account of the resurrection is he has caused an explosion this morning. And you know what happens after an explosion? Your ears ring and you don't really know what's going on. You're trying to get your bearings. You're surprised at what just happened. And that's precisely what Luke has done. All the characters are caught off guard and they're criticized for it. The angels say, you shouldn't have even come looking here for Jesus. He's risen like he said. And I think by doing this, by writing the story this way, Luke is inviting us to do two things, just like he did on Palm Sunday. One, to try to enter into the characters and be there that morning and to realize Easter morning at first was a morning of a lot of doubt and confusion for most people. We get to live through these characters. But then, just like on Palm Sunday, we're also invited to not be like them. We're also called to remember, and that's why we gather here this morning, to hear the story again. Because unless we remember and unless we hear the word given to us, we cannot believe. Faith comes by hearing. And what do we hear this morning in this word? Of course, we know, but we need to be reminded that death and hell and sin have been vanquished that the same faith comes to us that came to the women, and it comes in the same way. It's no different than how they believed. It's the same way we believe, by the words that proceed from the mouth of God. It's by hearing and remembering. In remembering that this day, Jesus died for us, and that as we hear this story, God promises to give us the Holy Spirit through it who comes and allows us to enter into the joy this morning and celebrate. Everything in creation is different now. Everything because of what Jesus did. Death is no more. Sin is no longer our identity. We have eternal life. The grave is overthrown. And Luke, in a sense, is asking you this morning to receive this joy that comes from remembering To see the man on the donkey, the man on the cross, the man who's not in the tomb this morning, who discarded the grave. And Luke says, to receive this man, 
to receive this good news, all you have to do is remember, is listen and hear. We don't need miracles to believe, but ears. And Jesus says this often, let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when we hear, what we see is the love story that God comes for us and we rejoice. And all the doubt and all the confusion from the explosion, the aftermath, it begins to fade as we say, wow, this really happened. He really has risen from the dead. And it's a new morning and it's a new day and my life has new meaning. My sin is forgiven. And every Sunday is a celebration of this day because God doesn't want you to forget. It's by remembering and hearing that we grow close to God and we realize that God is for us, not against us, and we rejoice. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, on this day so long ago, you overthrew the grave. You did something unprecedented in history. And you defeated death. And Lord, you have established your church here on earth in the time between the times to preach this good news and to love one another, to pray for our enemies and to forgive them and to usher in the kingdom because we stand as those who have peace with you and have been forgiven by you. And Lord, life can be very difficult sometimes, filled with all sorts of surprises and challenges, just like these characters were surprised and confused long ago on this morning. But in your grace and patience, you called them to remembrance, and in our own suffering and in our own questioning, call us to remembrance that we may rest in the firm and assured word that you have given us, that everything has now changed. And so for our needs, we celebrate and we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he bled and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he Gives 
Good morning, and I hope you're enjoying our Easter Sunday service here at Eelside. And might I say that those Easter outfits are on point. I mean, I even put on a jacket for the announcements. And what do you think of the Easter bonnet I'm working on? I got the chicken thing. I mean, Minnie Pearl would be proud. Oh. <laughs> Although I'm missing the price tag. Any of you under the age of, let's say, 45, might have to ask somebody about the Mini Pearl reference. I'm also ready with my friend, the chick. <laughs> oh, there we go. And talking about pearls, ladies, you can get your pearls of wisdom every Wednesday with Renew. See that transition there? Our community group, women's group, that meets every Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. and are going to start their spring session this week. Their theme is Cultivating a Climate of Peace. And you will find some peace because childcare is provided. This Wednesday, it's another family dinner night featuring the cooking exploits of Chef Elaine McLaughlin. It's going to be ham with apple chutney. And no, that's not right. Also, there's going to be mac and cheese, and that's not right either because everybody knows that Bob Squarepants is sponge and not cheese. Everybody knows that. It starts at 6 p.m., and the whole family is welcome. But we do ask that you sign up after the service so we know how much ham and mac and cheese to prepare. <laughs> you will want to stay after because Hillside Kids and the youth groups will meet. Next Saturday, we'll be hosting from 9 a.m. to 11 our Rise Against Hunger meal packaging event. You will want to attend if for no other reason than you get to wear a hairnet. And really, <laughs> who does not look good in a hairnet? If you have not participated in this event in the past, you are missing out on a great family event that serves a cause of preparing many meals for people around the world. Bring your family and grab a couple of friends. We have plenty of hair nets to go around and there's lots of work to be done. This Saturday at 9 a.m., Rise Against Hunger. On Tuesday, April 26th, Hillside 3D is gonna meet. Now, normally it, this is reserved for women only. However, this time, everyone is invited to attend their international themed dinner that will be held in the fireside room from 6.30 to 8.30. They will be hosting Samaritan's Purse director, Barb Stopa, who will be sharing some very intentional ways that you can help the refugees from the Ukraine. There will be multiple international dishes to share. Remember, this one is open to everyone, but please sign up in the planning center so we know how much to prepare. There is so much more happening every week at Hillside, so the best thing to do is to stop by the Welcome Center to say hello and then check out the sign-up table to see what there is for you. Enjoy the rest of your Easter Sunday and the traditional start of spring. And don't forget that Vacation Bible School begins on July 11th. I'm only saying that because it always sneaks up on us. Oh, come on, buddy. Let's go. Well, thank you for uh, joining us for worship uh, today. We wish you, of course, a very blessed remainder of your Easter with your friends and your family. I ask you to stand to receive the benediction. It says, May the loving power of God, which raised Jesus to new life, strengthen you in hope, enrich you with his love, and fill you with joy in faith. Go in peace and the love of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. time together. He paid the debt. He did not owe. I owed a debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song.
bless you, church. You are dismissed.